morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Good morning to two of you. Welcome to Exodus. Uh, I'm just happy that you guys are with us. Um, before we get started today, we do have um, a couple of announcements, and um, actually Pastor Kai is going to share announcements. Before he does, I do want to um, just kind of remind us a couple of things. Like, uh, so we are Exodus. We are the English ministry here at Living Water Bible Church, right? So unless you completely miss all the, you know, masses of Chinese-speaking adults that leave this auditorium before us, you would know that uh, we have a church, uh, we're a part of a church that is that has two congregations, but we are one church, uh, we're one church family. And, um, and so I am uh, the pastor here for our English ministry, and Pastor Kai is our senior pastor and in charge of, uh, you know, the Chinese ministry, but kind of overseas uh, is the lead pastor for our church as a whole. Um, and he just wants to kind of come up and share uh, a little bit, uh, some changes that are going to be happening for him personally um, that will kind of lead out and, um, and be, uh, be something for our whole church to uh, embrace as well. So if you want to just give a hand to Pastor Kai. future change in my ministry that I want to share with the family. Um, uh, you probably just didn't know that I was called into the ministry uh, almost like 20 years ago, in 1993. So I left uh, my uh, profession uh, and uh, being trained uh, as a pastor and serving this church since. Uh, when I was called, my calling was twofold. One is to uh, ministering uh, people here, especially the Chinese immigrants, and uh, to share the gospel, and to lead them to Christ, and to build up the church here. But the other fault is to uh, go back to China eventually, and to bring the good news back there, and to build the church there. So um, over the last past, uh, past 20 years, I was doing the first part here with uh, everybody else, and uh, 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 we are very glad uh, to have Pastor Crunch join us uh, almost like four years ago, right? Time just flies. But it's uh, time for me to come, uh, at times come that uh, I feel the God's calling uh, for me to go back to China. So I have uh, just announced to the Chinese congregation that in the year of tw uh, 2014, I will be uh, resigned uh, as a minister here and moving most of my ministry back to China as a missionary. So uh, so I just want to share this uh, news with the family, and uh, we do have a, a transition committee, which Pastor Kearns is part of it, and we want to prepare our church and eventually find someone to replace me. But what I want to share with you is no matter who my replacement will be, our church vision to build a very strong English ministry that ministering to multi-ethnic, multicultural uh, here in the UTC area will never change. So uh, uh, both congregations will work uh, side by side to achieve that goal. And that's the vision we receive from God. So uh, I just want to share that. And uh, I still have uh, over a year here. So I will <laughs> still enjoy a lot of activity sports with you and perhaps, uh, perhaps short mission with you. So I just want to let you know ahead of time. Uh, so that's my sharing, and uh, may God's love and blessing be with you. Thank you. Hold on. Yeah, why don't we, um, um, pa Pastor Kai, is, I would like to share a couple things, actually. Um, I was personally apprehensive of, of working in a Chinese church uh, after I came out of seminary. And actually, the first time I came and visited uh, Living Water Bible Church, uh, back then we were known as CBC West Campus, I came and I was, I was really scared, actually. And I was like, oh, I don't think I want to, you know, um, I, don't want, I don't know if I want to work here, right? Like, it seemed like the, you know, all of the adults had left, you know, there's like nobody around, um, there's some youth around. And, and I was like, oh, I don't know if an English ministry, you know, a second generation ministry will really thrive, will really grow here. 
And uh, the second week I came, I was asked to come for two weeks. I, I met Pastor Kai. He wasn't here the first week. And, and he took me out to lunch. And, um, and it was at lunch that he shared his vision uh, for, for what the church could look like, for how um, our ministries could work together, how we could build uh, something here, build a home here, I think, uh, in Exodus, in our English ministry, that will really uh, reach and bless uh, people, those that would be willing to come. And, and really it's because of uh, Pastor Kai, um, and then through a lot of discussion with the other church leadership that, that um, you know, I was really convinced that, that we have an amazing opportunity here um, to, you know, to, to minister however way that we feel God is calling us, you know, to be, to be a ministry, you know, to serve and to, to share the gospel in, you know, whatever form or whatever function that, that God is calling us. And we have that amazing opportunity here. And so I want to thank Pastor Kai, you know, um, for, you know, just for his, you know, just vision and foresight and also friendship. And, um, and, and I believe in our church, you know, I believe, you know, um, the pastor doesn't make a church, uh, God makes the church. And, and we have a, we have a, we have a positive future ahead of us um, uh, for the church as a whole. It's a victory. Send Pastor Kai to China because um, that will be an awesome uh, mission field for him. So why don't we pray? Um, why don't we pray for Pastor Kai? Uh, let's, we should pray for his family as well um, and and our ministry here at church. So let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for just a servant of yours here. We thank you for him. We thank you for his family, Lord. Um, we thank you for your calling on his life, Father God. To serve and to love you, Lord, and to love your people, and specifically now in China. And as we have this year, Lord, to, to prepare, I pray, Lord, it will be a year of preparation, of wisdom, Lord, and also of appreciation, Father God, for the gifts that you give us through the servants that, that are with us, Lord, um, uh, for however long we have them. And so we thank you, Father God, uh, we pray for him and his family, Lord. We ask that you would bless them, um, as you use them to bless others. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. series for us uh, here at Exodus over these next uh, few weeks. I'm not sure how long it's going to last, um, but it's going to be a series that will last more than twice. And, and I realized, you know, in reflecting over last week's message and, and just over time, sometimes it's, you know, last week we talked about the cost of discipleship, and we talked about, you know, how Jesus says, like, if you want to follow me, you need to be able to give up everything, right? You need to bear your cross. You need to walk with me every day. And, and you know, and sometimes we portray this Christian life a lot, you know, very often as something that's, like, really, really hard, you know. And I'm not saying that it's not really hard. It is really hard, but we, we kind of, like, portray, you know, we have a picture of, like, okay, we're just going to kind of suffer suck it up and, like, deal with it here on earth, you know, and then once we get to heaven, like, it's going to be awesome, right? And then it'll be worth it. And I don't think that's necessarily what the Bible teaches about the, the Christian life, actually. You know, and I think the Bible teaches, you know, something else, something different, something that is way more hopeful and way more positive about how we are meant to be living today and what that means, what it means that we have a relationship with Christ in our lives, right? What it means that you know, that we have a relationship with God, what it means that we have the Holy Spirit working in us. And that there's this picture of life, you know, that portrays that, yes, there is difficulty, and yes, there is, you know, hardships, and yes, there is tragedy, but there is a huge positive, there is a huge blessing that comes with being in a relationship with God. 
right? And we talk, you know, we say the cost of discipleship is, is your life, and we think that's really, really hard. And I will tell you, I think the cost of not being a disciple is even greater. And so I want to look at some passages. I want to talk to us, and I, I want to, you know, I really am hoping that what we can have in our minds as we go through this passage, these passages today, that, man, life is good when it is in Christ. That there is an abundant, amazing, transformative life that happens when we walk, when we move you know, in accordance with Christ and who he is in his spirit. And if you have your Bibles, you can open up to John 10.10. 10. It says this. This is Jesus' teaching.
a type of joy that even in the middle of imprisonment, they can sit in chains and still worship and still sing praises to God. To glorify his name in the midst of all tragedies. And there's real joy. Right? Like, wouldn't you want that? <laughs> wouldn't you want this fruit? Wouldn't you want these results of a spirit-led life, of a, of a spiritual life? in your life? Christ says, I have come that they may have life, and not just life, but that they may have it to the full. That this isn't just some future promise, this isn't just some, you know, this will happen in heaven, or this will happen after we pass on, but that this is supposed to be the result of life now, <coughs> here. The only problem is that maybe our lives don't always characterize this, right? A good number of us have been believers for a long time. And, and our lives don't seem to always have this. I still get, like, I don't have this peace. And I don't have this joy. I don't have this gentleness, this love, this kindness in my life. I don't have that self-control. And why? Jesus teaches it. Why don't we have it? Why don't we always have it? This life is demonstrated for us in the Bible. People who have this life. It's demonstrated for us in real life as we see spiritual, like mature Christians. Right? We see our spiritual forefathers in Paul and the disciples and the apostles, you know, and, and the maturity of their faith, and they had a life that exudes this love, this joy, this Ultimately, it's found demonstrated in the life of Christ. A lot of times I think we look at the picture of Jesus' life and we're like, that is awesome, but I wouldn't want it. <laughs> right? We look at the disciples and the stuff that they went through and we're like, you guys are awesome, but I don't want it. And I think we do that because we're still attached a lot, oftentimes to things of this world, to our own desires. But these people who had this life, I don't think they would have traded it. They wouldn't be looking at us and be like, oh man, I wish I would have had Clarence's life. No, oh man, I wish I had, you know, this, uh, this much more easy life. They wouldn't have traded it for the world. They gave it up. And I think the reason why this life, this amazing life, this spiritual life, is something that sometimes we find absent in our personal lives is simply because we just don't cooperate. We just don't cooperate with, with how the Spirit of God is calling us, how His Word is teaching us. presence is informing us. I like to play basketball decent amount. I am okay. But there was one day, many, many years ago, on one particular day, where I was awesome. <laughs> okay? I was so ridiculously good that day. Like, it was one of those days where, like, every single shot was going in. It was just, I was playing, we, I would play after church with some friends on Sunday afternoons, and we're at some playground, some middle school playground, and we're playing basketball. This is in Maryland, right? 
And I just was completely on fire for the entire day. Like if you've ever played, there's this video game called NBA Jam, and where if you make three shots in a row, your guy goes like on fire, right? When he shoots the ball, there's like smoke trailing from it, right? And you can shoot it basically from anywhere on the, on the screen, right? And it's gonna go in. And that was basically how it was. It was so awesome that I remember it to this day, like how awesome that day was for me. Like I made everything. At the end of the day, after we're done playing, we're just like fooling around and we're shooting from like half court, right? Half court of the playground. I was like four for five, like just easy, like stroke it. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I wish if there's any day that I was like in the NBA or if there's any day that I was trying out for like a professional sports basketball team, like it should have been today, right? Like I would have been, I would have gotten at least like a one day contract. <laughs> <laughs> and it was glorious. I've never had that experience since. Not one of those days where it's just like, it just clicks and everything is on fire. But every time I play basketball, I kind of hope that I will. Right? I kind of hope that I will, but the truth is I don't really play all that much and I don't practice all that much and I don't try all that hard. And so I can't really actually expect that these days will happen. Right? I don't really set my life around trying to accomplish this. I just live life kind of hoping that, that one day it'll just click at the right time, on the right chord, in the right situation, and I'll just be on fire. And I think a lot of times we as believers, we, we treat our Christian lives, we treat our spiritual lives like this. We see stories in the Bible of people's amazing sacrifices, of amazing experiences, and we're like, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. Right? And we don't, and we forget the preparation, we forget the work that is involved as a part of that. We want to do the healing of Jesus that Jesus Christ did, but we don't go away in the morning and spend time praying, talking with God. We want to feed 5,000, but we don't, you know, we don't experience and take times of solitude, of charity, of, of developing this deep spiritual life. You know that Jesus, like, prepared for ministry? You know that Jesus himself, right, prepared, had to prepare for the ministry that God called him to do. If anybody didn't have to prepare, it would have been Jesus. And, and actually, you probably think he probably didn't have to, but he did as an example. But he spent 40 days fasting. Right? He spent you know, his childhood training up you know, under his parents' tutelage, right? when he, probably he knew way more than they did you know, at a young age. He got baptized by John the Baptist, right? And these things were done to fulfill prophecy, but it was also done, I believe, to be an example for us. For us to understand that this amazing, abundant life that comes with Christ requires our cooperation. But are we living lives just hoping that one day we're just going to catch on fire? And it'll just all fit and we'll just be awesome. And everything will work. Right? The Apostle Paul learned of Jesus' lifestyle and he desperately tried to follow it. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 4.16. Uh, next slide, girls. It says this, therefore, this is Paul talking, therefore I urge you to imitate me. Right? For this reason I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life, my practical way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in the church. Right? He tells people, imitate me because my life is you know, centered around the life of Christ. 
right? Later on, and it's not in, I didn't put it in the slide, but later on in 11, chapter 11, verse 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right? He wasn't just imitating Christ's teaching and just trying to take on his teaching, but he was actually trying to adopt the lifestyle of Christ. Right? He was training himself to be, to live in the same lifestyle as Christ, so that he would have the same life as Christ. First Timothy 4, 7, and 8 says this, and this is what he taught to Timothy, right, to teach to his church. Found there. Oh, can we go to the next slide, girls? And he says this, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. The word train here is the same word that we get the word gymnasium from. Right? It, is a practice, it is a working out training. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. It is valuable for here. It is valuable for now. That real transformation and real fruit is meant to come out of our lives with Christ. We're here. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And because of this, we are going to start this series on spiritual disciplines. We're going to start a series where we're going to dive through kind of different spiritual disciplines and what the Bible teaches about them, how they were modeled for us in the life of Christ and other disciples and other Christian forefathers. Right? And the purpose of all of these dis disciplines is not just to have like a checklist of something to do and make sure that you are right. But the purpose of these disciplines is so that we can experience the life, the abundant life, the abundant spiritual life that God is calling for us, that Jesus died and rose again for us to have. A love that actually you know, takes hold of peace, love, joy, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. When I was taught about spiritual disciplines, I thought that they were just things that I had to do. It made me a good Christian to do them. I remember we would, when my friends started doing devotions at around middle school, like some friends... You know, they were the good ones, right? They would, we had these devotionals that we would pass out at church and they would do them. And I remember one day I was like, oh yeah, I guess I should do them. So I went over to my friend's house and um, he had all these like little devotional books and they call them campus journals. I don't know if anybody had these. And they have like a little story and a verse and then you like write something down at the bottom. And I was like, oh man, I need to catch up, right? So I took like three of them and I did 30 in like one day, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, oh, I'm good for a while. <laughs> Right? Like, I'm safe, you know? I remember in seminary, we had these, like, prayer projects that we would do for, um, for one class, right? And there was, like, 12 that we had to do throughout the semester. And one guy was like, and I didn't, you know, he, I don't know what was up with him, but he's like, I don't want to have to deal with doing all of these, you know, I'm just going to do them all at once, right? <laughs> so he did them, like, all in one day. And I guess, I don't know how that works, right? Like, he's like, well, I spent 12 hours praying yesterday. <laughs> I wrote down all of my little answers to all these questions that I had to do throughout the week. Are we missing the point? Like, is that the point? Right? Just to do it? Just to get it done? Just to be, quote, unquote, a good Christian? Or is the reason why these disciplines are offered to us is that we actually have, they are a door, they are an opportunity for us to cooperate with the Spirit of God moving in our lives. Uh, Dallas Willard, he, you can go to the next slide, he has this one quote talking about the spiritual disciplines, and he says this, the disciplines are activities of mind and body purposefully undertaken to bring our personality and total being into effective cooperation with the divine order. The disciplines of fasting reading our Bible, of praying, of meditation, of 
solitude, and silence. They aren't just things to do to say like, hey, I'm a good Christian. But they are ways that we train, right? They are ways that we open our lives and we cooperate with our mind and our body with what the Spirit of God wants to do in us. So we're going to do this series. And we're going to preach through them. We're going to share how to do them, what the Bible says about them. And, and I hope we'll be challenged as a church to, to, with our minds and with our bodies, cooperate with what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. And that we will see and experience and taste this abundant life that Christ came to give us. It's not going to be easy, it's not going to be simple, but I believe it will be amazing. And I hope that it's something that we can all engage in, and no one's going to shame you if you don't. We desire, we desire to live this abundant life, to know Christ in this way, not just in what he did, but in who he was. And, and I want to encourage all of us, and let us live this disciplined life and experience his goodness through it. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, that, that you have come to, to affect real change and real transformation in our hearts, Lord. That the life that you give us, Lord, is not just something that is far away, but it is present. It is real. It's amazing, Father God. Maybe a little scary, too. But I pray, Father, Lord, that we would be able to take faith and, and, and be encouraged to, to walk in a manner, Lord, that, that really seeks to cooperate with what your Spirit is doing in our hearts, Lord, and doing in our lives and doing in our church. Father God, and that you would remind us again of how good you are and how good life is, Father God, with you and in you. And that we would have joy, peace, patience, kindness.